So let's uh, move on now, and we'll talk about the uh, in cloth part of all this. So I've done uh, the bullet animation. I've done some retiming. Uh, let's actually apply now some uh, in cloth animation. And I don't want to do it in the context of the whole scene. I'm actually just going to do it kind of on this domino, just kind of standing in isolation here, just for, for testing. So I'm going to take this domino, and if I push play, nothing happens. You can see it just stays there, because I have no dynamics in my scene. I have no, no uh, in cloth in my scene. So I'm going to go to my in cloth menu. I'm going to create an in cloth and pull back a little bit. As soon as I push play, you can see gravity takes over, and then that falls to the ground, starts to kind of compress in on itself. Uh, what I really want to do is have it collide with this object. So once again, I'll go to in cloth. I'll create a passive collider. Now when I push play, that's going to fall to the ground and it's going to crumple up into just a, a mess, basically. So that's not what I want. I actually want this to retain its shape a little bit better than that. So let's just go into the in-cloth node. We'll go to the attribute editor, and I've got a bunch of dynamic properties associated with this. I don't really need my graph editor right now. I've got a bunch of dynamics properties associated with this. So first thing I might want to do is increase kind of the the resistance uh, of changing shape. So I've got different types of resistance, stretch, compression, bend resistance. So I don't care much about the stretchiness, but I might want to bump up the compression resistance and maybe bump up the bend resistance. And I'll play that back, and that will keep it from bending, and it will keep it from compressing in on itself. And it creates more of this kind of like almost like jelly-like shape. Not exactly what I want. It's still kind of folding in on itself, so I might want to create maybe some rigidity. So I've got a rigidity attribute in here. I can bump that up a little bit, play this back, and now it's going to behave a little bit more like kind of a springy, kind of bouncy mattress. So that's looking a little bit more like I want. Uh, one thing to point out is you can actually use a bunch of presets for this. So there are presets in here that allow you to control uh, all these parameters at once. So for instance, if I want this to be uh, like a burlap, I can make that burlap. It will set all the parameters, and then when I play this back, it's going to behave like kind of a thick uh, material, burlap for lack of a better word. Uh, it maintains a little bit of its shape, but it still kind of collapses in on itself. Switch this to like uh, thick leather. It's going to be similar, but it's probably going to be a little bit firmer and a little bit less inclined to cave in on itself. Uh, and then I can combine these as well. So I can create all different kinds of effects by blending, say, for instance, uh, a T-shirt material with a burlap material. So I'm going to go in and also talk a little bit about uh, colliding other objects. So let's actually just leave it there with the, the leather. And let's say that I wanted now to influence this with that domino that's going to crash into it. Just for simplicity, I'll just take a, a simple sphere, and I'll just put it over here, and I'm going to animate it kind of moving through. So right about there at, just say, in the middle of the animation, let's say frame 135 or so, I'm going to set a keyframe. I'll go back and I'll move this forward and I'll set a keyframe so that as this collapses, that's going to kind of move towards it. Right now, it's not a collision object, though. It's just going to pass right through it. So all I have to do is just make that a collider. So just like I did with the ground, I'll just go to in cloth and I'll just say make passive collider. I'll play this back. And now as that starts to collapse, you can see that when the sphere comes into contact with it, it'll just push it right over and then it'll just bounce down and collapse on the ground. So depending on the type of uh, object it is, it's going to react differently, of course. So I've got an example here uh, where I actually added uh, a little bit of animation on a few of the parameters. So this actually is using a little bit of uh, rigidity. It's also using a little bit of uh, an inflation. So it's actually inflating the volume uh, with a little bit of air to, to keep the size. And then uh, I'm also using a little bit of wind to actually push it forward. So you can use collision or you can use wind. So once you get something looking more or less the way you want it, so at this point let's just pretend like this is exactly what I want, and now I want to reuse this in another scene, I would have to bake this out. So uh, instead of baking to transforms, though, I'm going to be baking to cache. So we've got a couple of different caching options. So nucleus itself, all the ends in here, in cloth, in particles, they use something called in cache, which has a lot of bells and whistles associated with it. It allows you to do things like blending of caches, layering of caches, editing of caches. Uh, if you need to send this at somewhere outside of Maya, we also have the ability to use an Alembic cache. So Alembic cache 
uh, can be used, but it's typically used more often for externalizing it and sending it somewhere else. For instance, if I wanted to send this class to Mac. But if I'm working with it in Maya, I might as well just use the end cache because it gives me a lot more functionality. So what I would do is I would basically take this animation, I would go to end cache, I would uh, create a cache. So I'd create a new cache from this object that would save out frame by frame the entire animation for that object. And then I could bring that into a different scene. So I'm actually going to bring this into uh, the full scene that has the rigid body dynamics. And I've got my cloth object at the end. But I want to make that object bounce, so I'll use the cache to do that. So I'll pull in a little bit. I'll go into my cache settings. And with this object selected, I will just attach the cache that I previously exported. I called this deflate domino. I'll attach it. And when I push play now at the beginning, that will immediately behave in the exact same way as that dynamic file, that in cloth file that I showed before. Of course, the problem is now it has no relationship at all to what's in my scene. So now I just need to do a little bit of tweaking. So for one, I don't want it to start at frame one. I actually want it to start right there where that domino is going to collide with it. So let's say right about there at frame 106. If I come in here, I can grab the cloth node itself, or rather the cache node, and I can just reset the start frame for this. So I'm going to say I want this to start exactly frame 106. I'll push play. And now right as that domino falls, then the cloth is going to fall as well. Let's add a, a few more frames. There we go. Problem is it doesn't actually line up in space. So the advantage of a cache also is that I can just pick it up and move it around. So let's just say I wanted to go in here and reposition this. I can use the node itself. I typically will go in and create a group, which gives me a higher level transform that I can then edit. Uh, it also gives me a pivot at the bottom in this case, which I would rather have so I can rotate it around space. But now I'm just going to go in and just kind of visually line this up. So right about there where the domino is supposed to hit it, I'm just going to kind of visually line it up. Something along there. I might even want to add a little bit of rotation to it, something like that. And now the cache will just basically work from that point. So you can basically layer on these transforms on top of caches in order to position them at relative points in your scene. Now, the other thing I might want to do is change the rate of the cache. The cache itself can be retimed. So the cache itself actually has timing information on it. So if I set this to be 2, for instance, and I play this back, now that's going to actually slow down the cache. So the cache itself, the animation is going to be uh, twice as long or, or uh, half as fast. I'm going to put this at, say, maybe 0.8, and that's going to accelerate it a little bit. Let's change my frame range here. Now I play this back, and now that looks a little bit better as far as the timing goes. Now the last thing I might want to do is add a little bit of extra animation on top of this, because the cloth bounces, but it doesn't bounce enough. But rather than going back to the beginning and just resolving the, the cloth, or trying to, to bake the, or rather put the push into the cloth solve itself, I actually just want to go in and add a little bit of animation. So another advantage of the cache is that I can just add animation on top of this. So Similar to the way I moved it, I can go in and say, okay, right about there where it compresses. So it's going to reach its maximum compression right about there. I'm going to go to the top level node, set a keyframe. I'm going to go a few frames forward and right where it hits, right about there, I'm just going to kind of pick it up and move it, set a keyframe. And now really quickly, I just created kind of this lunging motion for the cloth. Now I might actually want to go in there and insert a keyframe in the beginning, maybe position it a little higher, maybe even rotate it. I can add these kind of extra transforms. Now I get more of a kind of a vertical jump as well. And if I push play on this, you can see there that looks a little bit looks a little bit uh, more impactful now when it does that kind of spring forward.